I think data sometimes just needs time to mature. And... Yeah, you cogitate for a while, don't yeah. you, I suppose. <laughs> You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Cosmic Cast, brought to you by the Earth and Solar System team at the University of Manchester. I'm joined with regular co-hosts Tom Harvey, Marissa Lowe and Ricky Bahir. Hello. Hello. And joining me this week is Lee White from the Royal Ontario Museum. How's it going? Hi, yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. No, it's a pleasure, absolutely. Um, So you're a postdoc over there? Yep, yeah, I've been three years now. But you originally did your PhD in Portsmouth, didn't you, I think? Yeah, yeah, I'm Pompey born and bred as well. So. Oh, yeah, you're out, fantastic. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, from just outside the city. But yeah, lo- local lad. So yeah, local lad done good, I'd like to think. <laughs> well, it's a nice city. I quite like Portsmouth. Yeah, you have to see the right bits. But no, I've got a lot of, a lot of pride coming from Portsmouth. Still follow the football team as much as possible. No one over here has heard of them, bless them. But... <laughs> you're good. educating them. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you are a lunar scientist. Um, fleetingly. Fleetingly. So, uh, so I guess how would you? Because you did a, you did some lunar stuff during your PhD. Um, kind of on and off. So my, my PhD was looking at so PhD at the University of Portsmouth with mm. James Darling was looking at the effect of shock on accessory minerals. So zircon and bdellioite in particular. So uranium bearing geochronometers. You know, really handy little minerals to find. Um, I did my PhD work up at the Sudbury Impact Structure, so actually, ironically, just here in Canada, so four hours up the road from Toronto, um, looking at a series of samples going out from the impact melt sheet and seeing what happens to these minerals in these kind of increasing and decreasing shock conditions and how we can correlate that with dating. So what, what does that shock pressure do to uranium lead in the crystal? Mm-hmm. Um, so that was more of my background. Um, when I was down there, we got very lucky to work with um, Anna Chernock and Mahesh Anand from the Open University. So. Anna brought down some Apollo samples, which was really exciting. So to have a look for uh, appetite, so phosphate minerals in them. Doing the same kind of technique we were, you know, James and I were doing on the subway stuff, which is EBFD, so electron backscatter diffraction. So looking at the internal microstructure of these crystals. And we did that to some of the Apollo samples to try and tie into Anna and Mahesh's work. And that's when we stumbled across sort of some slightly more interesting zircon and bdelliite, which ended up in sort of one of the more recent studies. So, but very fleetingly lunar scientist. So I've, I've, I've managed to play with a few Apollo samples and now over here a few lunar meteorites. But yeah, mm-hmm. kind of in, in and out a little bit. I like to still dabble. Mm-hmm. Well, it's good to keep yourself uh, grounded, I think, as well, in some of the terrestrial stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so did you manage to get out to um, Sudbury to do any field work? Uh, yeah, we've been up a couple of times. Yeah. So it, it was a geology that's absolutely stunning up there. Sort of shatter cones, you know, mm-hmm. big of a car. And yeah, pretty, pretty stunning. So what was the conclusions then? What does, um, does shock have a significant impact in terms of, uh, in terms of these geochronometers? Um, it does, especially in the higher shock conditions. So bdelliite is a really funny mineral. So mm. the zircon first is quite robust. So we, there have been years of experimental studies on that to look at micro twin formation, you know, sort of a 15 to 20 GPA. Um, you, that takes a lot to do anything to the uranium lead though. You almost have to recrystallize it. So you're talking about really high pressure and temperature conditions to really disturb that geochronometer. So bdelliite though, um, zirconia, so the constituent element, ZRO2 is the mineral, um, it actually goes through a series of phase transitions with increasing temperature and pressure. And for the pressure, that actually starts at around 5 GPA, so 5 gigapascal of pressure, which is quite low for a lot of planetary materials. When you think about Martian and Shergate, like, most are up in that kind of 30, 40, 50, sort of muscalinite bearing gigapascal range. So something going wrong at 5 GPA is really critical for bdelliite. And what actually happens is internally, the structure all starts to transition to this orthorhombic phase. So orthorhombic ZRO2, it becomes. And that actually is enough to start mobilizing the lead. And you start to move it to nanoscale mm-hmm. grain boundaries and start to lose it from the crystal. So yeah, it's actually really sensitive to those kind of lower shock conditions. Um, so I know you've just had a paper out recently. Um, was that summarizing these results then from your PhD? Um, so yeah, so the main PhD results were published in uh, Geology back in 2018, which was using bdelliite as a shock indicator. So even, you know, in, in rocks from Sudbury where you don't have quartz PDF, you don't have muscalinite, you don't have all these kind of major sort of diagnostic shock features, you can still find this really discrete evidence in these little five micrometer bdelliite grain that sort of speak of the high pressure history the rock's seen. So that was kind of the main finding, but I got very lucky during my PhD. I was working with, obviously, James and then uh, Desmond Moser, at the University of Western Ontario, so again over in Canada, keep keeping it local, um, and that was being exposed to atom probe tomography. 
So a very new technique for geoscientists and planetary scientists alike. Um, but effectively, you can go in and you can cut out these little five micrometer grains using a focused iron beam. You lift them out and then you actually can mount them on these little silicon posts and run them through an atom probe. You have to fib them down. So, so using the focused iron beam, you put them into a fingertip shape and they're about 100 nanometers at the top of that tip. So they're really, really, really tiny, about a thousandth the width of the human hair. And if we target the geochronometer or any phase boundaries or grain boundaries within there, then you can actually start to map out the chemistry and also the isotopic sort of composition. So Atom Probe is capable of resolving uranium isotopes and lead isotopes, so we can use it as a baiting technique as well. So that's the other thing I did a lot of ground truthing for in my PhD, and that, that was published back in 2017. Yeah, the Atom Probe is really cool, isn't it? Like, um, so did you, did you do a lot of the preparation work for these samples? Um, a, a lot of the preparation work, not, not much of the preparation, it was more it the sound... data analysis. Okay, because I say it sounds quite fiddly, it's not... <laughs> Yeah, no, I've done a lot more of the preparation since. But yeah, during my PhD, they wouldn't, they weren't too keen to let me get my hands on these kind of multi-million dollar instruments. Yeah. So, what's the advantages of using an atom probe? Um, it's length scale and isotopic resolution. So okay. you're at this sort of hundred nanometer, the hundred nanometer tip, but you're getting sub nanometer spatial resolution right. on each atom that you analyze, and as well as that, you've got the full width half maximum, sort of the mass resolution to pull apart discrete isotopes. You, I guess you, you it... can't tell, sorry, for, for like oxygen, you can't tell apart um, oxygen 17 from O16H. So there, there's a very discrete sort of discrepancy there. You can measure with like a, a SIMS or a nano SIMS, but unfortunately Atom Pro is not quite there yet. But you can tell 16 and 17. Yeah, I guess for context, for listeners then, it might be not pretty familiar. So we're talking about SIMS pits and nano SIMS pits. They tend to be more sort of tens of nanometers to sort of micron size, don't they? Exactly, yeah. So you're, you're getting, you know, you're losing a little bit on the mass resolution, but you're getting sub nanometer scale sort of isotopic yeah. analyses, which is yeah. pretty stunning, actually. You're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Just yeah. you look, yeah. It's almost an atomic scale, almost, isn't it? It's, it's um, I, I, I like not quite, but... scale. Yeah, let's try and use atomic scale where I can. I'm not quite sure what people think of that one. <laughs> it sounds cool, right? It, it does sound cool, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So, is it, is it the Atom Probe you're mostly using now in, in the labs in um, in the museum? Uh, yeah. So, obviously, working in the museum is really fun. Just being able to go in through the collection, sort of pick out a Martian or a Luna, or you know, we've got some um, Taggart Lake. So, like a really weird carbonaceous chondrite that's been kept in cryogenic mm. conditions its whole life. There's a really uh, good co uh, meteorite collection there, isn't there? I think I've I've certainly seen some of the the bits that are like, available for the public to look at, and that's that was really cool. Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's not the biggest in the world by any means. So something like the Smithsonian, you know, the Natural History Museum in London have more samples. But I think we've got the biggest collection of Martian main masses in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's kind of fun. You get more sort of weird, weird and wacky achondrites than quite a lot. Yeah. Of yeah. Um, so yeah, sorry. Um, so we've got the collection to play with. A lot of what I do generally day to day is more of the EBSD side. So just going through these samples, characterizing the grains using sort of microstructure, with a view to then dating them, whether that be mm. through SIMS, laser, atom mm. probe now, maybe. Um, we've done a few kind of ground truthing studies of atom probe. So we actually had a paper out on the same day as the recent Nature Astronomy paper in PNAS. So proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which was looking at Tagish Lake and using atom probe to find sort of discrete um, residues of early solar system fluid. Ah, yeah, I think I saw actually an article about that. That's quite cool. So that was, um, I think there was, there was an image about that where it was, was some circles with a load of like yeah, spots in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, framboids from the French framboise, so like raspberry. And they're there, there's these beautiful little interlocking sort of spheres effectively. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty beautiful. Mm. Mm. So yeah, so how, how do you find fluids then in these sorts of songs? How, how does that work exactly? Um, so obviously the aqueous alteration is pretty pervasive in a lot of the carbonaceous chondrites, so, but we don't find much straight evidence of those fluids. It's more sort of clay products and things yeah. like that. So, um, so but, Tagish Lake, sorry, just to backtrack a little bit, that's, it's, that's a bit of an oddball um, meteorite to start off with, isn't it? Yeah, so it's an ungrouped carbonaceous chondrite. Right. That's sort of the official, the official classification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it fell in Tagish Lake in Canada back in 2000 into an ice sheet. And the people that collected it were very smart. They never used hands. They made sure it was all under cryogenic conditions the whole way, it was straight mm. into a freezer. And it's kind of been that way ever since. So in terms of looking at early solar system volatiles, it's kind of a unique, unique opportunity. You can be pretty confident there's no terrestrial weathering in there. And all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so, yeah. so you get the sample, um, and it, it looks altered. There's lots of clay minerals and phyllosilicates and things. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's pretty comparable to a lot of those heavily altered carbonaceous chondrites. Mm -hmm. But the mineral we found was the magnetite. 
So right, okay. So obviously magnetic and previous groups have looked at these really, really weird um, framboids in Tagish Lake doing um, nano magnetism stuff. I don't know. It's well, well beyond me. So the framboids, uh, they're small spheroids of, of magnetite. Yeah. So these little sort of 200 nanometer framboids. They're okay. All and that's right. all magnetically driven. So when, when they looked at the magnetism of these things, they've all been like snapped end to end magnetically. Mm. And modeling it, the only way they could do that really was in um, a droplet of water. So you need, you know, it's all about the surface tension and what that does to them. I don't know. I, again, well beyond me. Um, but anyway, so there was evidence that these things formed in a droplet of water on the Tagus Lake parent body sort of four and a half billion years ago. Um, so what we wanted to do is actually go with the Atom Pro, target the sub nanometer boundaries between those sort of interlocking spheres mm -hmm. and see if we can resolve any sort of residual chemistry that might be trapped mm -hmm. in there. And um, yeah, we managed to find little pockets of sodium rich sort of magnesium rich, calcium rich kind of deposits. And obviously the only way that could have got there, you've got iron oxide minerals forming. That must have been the minerals forming, ramming all the incompatible elements into the boundaries. And that's where they've been preserved. Well, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's kind of cool. Very, very exploratory, but yeah, it's mm -hmm. a bit different. Do you think that's a technique then you could apply to other uh, carbonaceous chondrites, not just Tagish Lake? Or is that dependent on knowing that there's definitely no terrestrial component to it? Um, I think... you. It helps to know there's no terrestrial alteration, so you're not trying to pull apart whether it happened on Earth or on the pair yeah. of bodies. Um, but I'm, I'm very much shouting about Atom Pro being a technique you can use for anything. Mm -hmm. so, okay, we start using it for geochronology, now we're using it to try and target stuff like this. So, yeah. It's completely new for us. I say the first Atom Pro paper was um, from Phil Heck back in 2014, I think. Yeah. So there's maybe been 10 papers using it for planetary materials. So. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's becoming a bit more well-known now, isn't it? I see, you see people talking about it a bit more than you did like five years ago, even. So. Uh, yeah, just got to shout loud enough, I guess. <laughs> is it just an expensive piece of kit, then? Is that why few people use it? Um, it it's a pretty expensive bit of kit. So in Canada, there's only one. So it's just right, well, okay. University just down the road. In the UK, there's a few more. So mostly in material science department. Mm. So for material scientists, they've been using this technique for 50 years now. Mm. Um, mm. But it's just getting access to it and also the preparation. So like I said, it's all about the focused eye on being making these kind of fingertip, nanometer scale yeah. fingertip mm -hmm. examples. That's, yeah. kind of, that's more sort of cost prohibitive. Yeah. I guess it's all right for the materials people. They just got some thin, thin slither of steel or whatever they want to analyze. Whereas mm -hmm. we've got the stuff that are a bit more tricky to, to work around perhaps. <laughs> yeah, quite often they'll get their feature in the top sort of two nanometers of their tip, run it for half hour and call it a day. But obviously when we're trying to do isotope work, we want as many atoms as possible. Yeah. But yeah, they're running it, it's like, oh, we've got enough. Like, no, keep going. Keep going. And you could build these like 3D models, can't you? I think I've, I've seen yeah. where you can sort of like turn like models of these like little sections and look at structures internally and things. Yeah, so that, that fundamentally that's the main output. You get a 3D atomic scale map of oh. isotopes and elements. So yeah, because it's, so you, you've got your tip in the atom probe, it's being irradiated with a laser. That energy is going to the tip, breaking off atoms one at a time when they get really excited. But that's coupled with a time of flight mass spectrometer. So it's measuring how fast it goes from the tip to the actual sort of mass detection instrument. Um, so you get the mass from that. You know the depth in the sample based on which laser pulse sent the, air, it sent the cation away. So the first pulse is obviously in the very front of the tip and the millionth pulse would be sort of a million deep. So you can use that to reconstruct. And then you get the XY coordinate from where they hit on the time of flight detector. So you get the mass and you get your X, Y, and Z coordinates, which means, yeah, you get full 3D, 3D reconstruction. And yeah, you can, you can spin it and play with it and zoom in. And I know um, Kamika Instruments, the guys that make the instrument, are starting to do like VR walkthroughs and stuff that you can actually put oh, on the head so and go cool. through your atom yeah. probe. I mean, it's an amazing bit of kit. I remember the first time someone told me about an atom probe. It was an LPSC a few years ago. And I, just, I couldn't believe that a bit of kit out there existed that could do this. It, just, mm -hmm. it was mind-blowing at the time. <laughs> And ultimately, we have no idea what it can do. Like I say, we're really at the tip of all this. So mm -hmm. what kind of isotopes you can pull apart? I say people are trying to get oxygen working. People are trying to get, you know, uh, Luke Daly at Glasgow is doing a lot of great work trying to get rare earth elements measured with it. Oh, as well. cool. So, yeah. yeah. So what, what is, sorry, what, what is the goal of the EBSD work that you're doing? And then I guess it, it might be worth, if you could just give a bit of an overview of what it is, because I guess it's one of the less well-known mm. kind of analytical techniques. Mm. Yeah, so it, unfortunately it kind of falls in the same ball pit as Atom Probe. So it's a day-to-day a -day technique for a lot of material scientists or using it to characterize their stainless steel and ceramics and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, for us, unfortunately, it's still a little bit underexplored. Um, fundamentally, you take your thin section. It's very surface sensitive. So you have to make sure the sample's had a good polish, normally with a, a vibromet, so nice high-resolution nanometer scale polish. 
Uh, you put it into your SEM with an EBSD detector, you tilt your sample 70 degrees, and that's effectively it. You find your feature of interest. The electron beam will obviously map across the grain. Because you're at that 70 degree tilt, you're diffracting off the crystal lattice onto the EBSD detector, and that detector is just really quickly imaging those diffraction patterns, so Kikuchi patterns. And that allows you to map structure. So effectively, all you're doing is mapping the orientation of the crystal mm -hmm. across the length of the crystal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the colors that we use for EBSD and all that kind of thing are just showing the different crystallographic orientations. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Going back into like Miller indices and all that kind of ABC axis kind of stuff. Um, mostly, we use it to characterize, now, we use it to characterize accessory minerals. So Zircon in particular, there's been a lot of work on that, trying to find micro twins and granoblasts, again, with a target for dating. So trying mm -hmm. to Pull apart these features and link them to lead loss. And this, um, this is stuff you wouldn't be able to see with a, with a regular SCM, basically. Exactly, yeah. So with a regular SCM, just in backscatter electron imaging, they just look smooth and happy and mm -hmm. modern. Yeah. So until you start to pull apart. I mean, it's no different, really, to try and tease apart more information with EDS or something like that. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start to look at it, you might see things like zoning, right? You know, TL imaging. Mm -hmm. that's zoning. Mm -hmm. It's just another imaging technique, effectively. But it's imaging the crystal structure rather than sort of chemistry or whatever. Um, and so that, that was the bulk of my PhD using EBSD on the mineral bedellii, yeah, to see if we can establish it as a shock indicator mm -hmm. or shock barometer, and then starting to correlate that with age dating, which is actually what led into the recent nature astronomy paper. So were you looking to see for the bedellii then twinning or recrystallization, or what, 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 what can you use, what can you actually see with the EBSD? So the answer when we first started was we didn't know. Mm -hmm. So no one had really looked at bedellii with EBSD before, mm -hmm. ever. So it's completely exploratory, looking at it in these crazy pressure temperature condition rocks and seeing what's happened to it. Obviously, important chronometer, so understanding that step was going to be critical to interpreting the age record of either in terrestrial impacts on Earth or planetary materials or whatever. Um, so yeah, we didn't know. We knew what people saw in Vircon, so it's slightly more robust phase. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it's completely, completely exploratory. And what we ended up stumbling across was incredibly complex sort of structures. So even in a mm -hmm. five micrometer crystal, You've got interlocking twins, it's crystal plastically deformed, so the whole thing's kind of twisting around. And right. we, couldn't, we couldn't really explain that. It's, you know, five gigapascals, although it's quite a lot, sort of geologically speaking, in terms of a planetary setting, it's quite, quite subtle. Mm -hmm. And to see this incredibly messed up crystal with those shock pressures was a bit weird. Mm -hmm. And that's what led us down the rabbit hole of phase transformations and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, because I guess for context, um, when you start to think about like remelting and stuff, you're almost at like 40-odd, 50-odd GPA normally, aren't yeah. you? So it's very low indeed. Yeah, that's really cool. So, yeah. You, you wouldn't form quartz PDFs or muscellanite or anything yeah. like that. Shattercone. Main All shock. those kind of things that you want to see to be like that's an impact structure. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't form those kind of low pressures. So then you can then say, uh, it's a question of, you, you, you can identify these structures in these bedaliites and you can say, well, these are good areas to target for dating. Then you've got a bit better understanding of what that age actually tells you. Even in terrestrial rocks, you get very complex polysynthetic twinning, mm -hmm. um, just in sort of a, an isigneous magma chamber on Earth. So if you take that complex twinning and then make it even more complex with phase transition and stuff like that, yeah, you need to know what you're targeting mm -hmm. to make sure you're getting either crystallization or an impact age, depending on mm -hmm. what, you know, what game yep. you're applying. Yeah. Well, then I guess, so that leads us then into um, the bedaliite that you studied for this, this lunar sample. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, so you looked at a bedaliite then from a lunar troctolite. Yeah, so it's one of the Apollo samples, 76535. There we go. So a troctolite is a coarse grain rock from the lunar crust. And am I right in thinking it's part of the MG suite? It is, yeah. That's what made the study quite, yeah. quite so, interesting. So yeah. for context then, this is a sample that people thought has intruded into the lunar crust at a later date after the LM, lunar magma ocean has finished solidified. So that, that was the original theory, yeah. Yes, yeah. Ke chemically, it was very complex. You've got your, uh, almost like a creep component, so a rare earth element rich sort of component that would normally be a bit deeper in the mm -hmm. crust. And then you've also got these sort of signatures, sort of like silica and stuff like that, which you'd normally associate with being a bit higher. Mm -hmm. So how you combine those sort of contradictory geochemical signatures into one rock was always a bit weird. So did you use some dating on the Bedeliite as well? Yeah, we did a little bit of um, sim dating with Martin Whitehouse so in mm -hmm. Stockholm. So all, all of that side of the project was very much led by Anna Chernock. So mm -hmm. obviously she brought the sample down, her and Mahesh were already looking at it from the Open University. Mm -hmm. um, come down to do the EBSD, looking at the phosphate minerals. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, just glancing through the sample, we you know, noticed this massive, well, massive, 200 micrometer bedellite. Mm -hmm. well, that's so big it, though, isn't it, for, mm -hmm. for these sorts of accessory minerals? 
Yeah, m most of the grains we've worked on have been on the order of sort of 10 to 15 micrometer. So yeah. we're talking about an order of magnitude bigger, it's just this whopping great grain. You know, you could even see it in like, an optical microscope, which is unheard of, really. Mm. And yeah, straight away, just looking at it down the microscope, you can see in weird interlocking twinning, just from the difference in the biofringence and you know, stuff like that. Uh, and we were like, wow, we gotta, we got to look at this guy. So yeah, we did. So looking at the sample um, and doing all your analysis on it, what did that tell you sort of about the formation of the, of the rock? So from the Bedelio crystal, I would say complex interlocking twinning. When we did the EBSD map, you start to see a few logical kind of relationships. So they're all um, orthogonally related, all of these twins. So they're all at 90 degrees to each other when you look at like a, a pole figure or a stereo net effectively. And that's really weird. 90 degrees naturally forming is kind of strange, right? Um, so what we did, we worked with a guy in Switzerland, Cyril Cairon, um, who's done Bedelio um, Zirconia work, so years in material science, because they use it to strengthen stainless steel and ceramics, and it's even used in like a dental filling and stuff like that. Well. Really? <laughs> but yeah, they, they use the phase transitions to strengthen all these materials. So we sent him the EBSD map, and we were like, mate, this is a bit weird. And he was like, yeah, it is. I mean, he was French, so he didn't say it like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and he, he ran it through his software, and effectively, all of those 90-degree orientations can be pieced back together into one parent phase. So at really high temperatures, Bedelia, uh, sort of above 2300 degrees Celsius, Bedelia becomes cubic zirconia, so most commonly known, obviously, as a replacement for diamond in jewellery. Um, as I say, you need incredibly high temperatures to form that, sort of 2300 degrees Celsius, which is really strange. So the only way we could explain that, and the only other previous occurrence, I should mention, of cubic zirconia on Earth is from the Mastatin Lake impact melt sheet. So or what, a 20, 28 kilometer diameter melt sheet in Canada. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they found evidence of this cubic zirconia phase in that. Um, so we, we couldn't think of any other way really to generate those kind of extreme temperatures on the moon, especially sort of mm -hmm. platonically stable, right? Without a whopping great impact melt sheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess that's that's awesome. I mean, I guess that's got a lot of implications then for you know what what this sample is actually telling you, though. So I suppose that you're proposing that it may not necessarily be a magnesium sweet rock, but may actually be part of a larger impact sheet. Um, I think well, so the, the whole classification of magnesium sweet, I think, is still fine. We might just have to reinterpret what the magnesium sweet represents. Yes. So okay. Geographically, it's very dispersed across the moon. Mm -hmm. um, some people are saying, does it need a creep component? Does it not? You know, the, the actual diagnostics of that sort of sweet. I've always yep. been a little up in the air. Yep. But what we're saying here is maybe it's just to do with the sort of the lithologies that impact melt sheet is subsampling. Mm -hmm. So in the case of a strong creep component, maybe it's a bigger melt, which you know dug down a little bit deeper, incorporated a lot more of that sort of creep rich material. Maybe that's where that signature is coming from. Whereas I guess that's easy to say. So go on. Sorry. I was gonna say I guess that's consistent with the sample being uh, quite deeper in the crust in the first place. So yeah, I mean, where on the moon exactly, we're not sure. So, you know, tentatively, it could even be something like self awakened maybe. Um, but that's really arm wavy. Um, but either way, a big impact melt sheet, I think, mm -hmm. is the most common sense sort of origin for this rock. But I think that's the thing to know. I am not a lunar petrologist. So this is all pretty new to me, all these terms. All, all I know for sure is that cubic zirconia forms when it's bloody hot. And the only way we can really form that is in a big impact melt sheet. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave that to, to you guys to work out. <laughs> but it's really cool, though. I mean, like, it's such an unusual uh, sample and, and there's such an unusual um, large grain in the first place. It makes you wonder sort of how many other of these large uh, Bedelia crystals are out there that other people haven't picked up on and, or and buried in, in bits of rock that haven't been sectioned for, for thin sections and stuff. Yeah, um, but as you say, like the MG suite, like it's a really complicated suite of rocks, and particularly from like the meteorite clasts that that, that we see of, of this particular suite, it's it's really complicated. I think there's still a lot of active debate in terms of quite what these rocks are telling us. Yeah, yeah. I think I think hopefully this will sort of inspire reanalysis of a lot of these kind of Apollo and you yeah. know lunar meteorite rocks to yeah see if there's more evidence of this. Quite often when Bedelio is reported in the petrological descriptions, it's literally oh Bedelio is there. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of it, you know. A lot yeah. of samples that contain Delia don't even report it because it is sort of five to ten micrometer. When you're doing like a whole section EDF map, you're just going to miss, it. you know. So you need it needs to be a focused search for this mineral. Yeah. But it's looking like scientifically it'd be really valuable if we can start to turn up more of them, find potentially wider evidence for high pressure and high temperature polymorphs, and yeah, hopefully try and use that to reinterpret a lot of the origin of these rocks. Yeah, absolutely. So was there anything unusual about the dating, or did the, did the dating work from this sample look just like any other MG suite? 
Um, so it, it gave a, a small spread of age of around 4.33 billion. Okay, so that's about typical for MG Suite, yeah. I think, more or less. Yeah, it, it? Okay. yeah it, it matched sort of existing Rubidium strong yeah. work and stuff like that. Um, the slight spread of ages made a lot of sense for the new sort of evolution of that grain we're saying. If it was, it must have been Bedelia originally. You don't mm. really crystallize cubic zirconia out of the mouth. You mm. know, you'd have to have zirconia enrichment off the chart. It's just not logical. Yeah. So the Bedelia must have been there in that target protolith before the impact. Just happily sat there. The big impacts come in, subsampled it. You need to go up to like sort of 3,000 degrees to melt zirconia. So it didn't get quite that hot, but it went above 2,300 degrees Celsius. Yeah. When we keep it. I mean, these are crazy temperatures. I mean, I suppose when you think about you know, what an average basaltic lava is, is it like, you know, 1,200, 1,300 degrees or whatever. That's like, that's, that's mad. I mean, I suppose when you consider the energy being put into the system, you've got a whopping great meteorite coming in. Obviously, you're evaporating rock locally. Mm. Yeah, so it makes sense there'd be a lot of residual energy to be mm. in that military. I guess that must tell you something about the size of the impact as well, because I suppose you'd need something fairly large, would you, in order to reach these sorts of temperatures? Um, I'm not sure. So I'd say the terrestrial occurrence is at Mastatin Lake. That's a 28 kilometer. Right. So I don't know. I mean, it, it potentially could be happening in smaller impacts than, yeah. than we know. We just, I'd say we haven't found much of it, so we haven't really got calibration on that kind of scale. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. So what's next? Are you going to try and continue this project and look for other samples, or was this just yeah. a, a one-off? And... Oh, no, I think you know, it's definitely worth, worth pursuing. I yeah. think the biggest question mark for us, so the, the trop plate we looked at, 76535, is effectively unshocked. So it's just a beautiful rock. You're crystalline pelagic clay. There's no effect of the widespread fracturing or anything mm. like that. Um, so it makes sense that the cubic heritage would be really well preserved there. The question mark is what happens if you had a cubic, a previously cubic rain and then you shock it either during ejection from the lunar surface or during mm. brecciation or you know yeah something like that you know do you overprint it with that sort of high pressure heritage yeah we, we don't know so if we're going to start looking for evidence of this stuff in the meteorite record i think we really need to get a better handle on that and that'll mm. probably be experimental work or like diamond anvil style stuff mm -hmm. all that kind of good stuff yeah awesome i guess it's been quite good getting to work with both the university and a museum for this project to you know have access to all the instruments but also lots of samples yeah, it's, it's kind of nice. You kind of fall in between the, the grey, you know, you're, you're sort of in the grey zone, really. So, yeah, quite fun. Just taking all the samples from one. So, um, that, for, for the more recent work, that's definitely been a perk. Like I say, this, this sample was um, from Mahesh and Anna. Mm -hmm. so it was, the data was collected sort of three years ago. So, it's just been one of those things we sort of sat on it. I think data sometimes just needs time to mature. And, yeah, you'd cogitate for a while, don't yeah. you, I suppose? <laughs> yeah, we, we just kind of revisited it. It was like, actually, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I went from there. And I feel like the case with lots of lunar samples, it's when there's a new instrument, you feel like you have to go th back through all the samples and reanalyze them anyway in case you find different things. Or, yeah, as you said, bedelliite isn't a mineral that's been looked at very much before, but maybe in, after this paper, people will go, oh, let's go back through and hmm. look, for, look for this now and see what we can see from that. Hmm. That'd, be, that'd be quite nice. Yeah, well, I think you know it's a great example as well of how sort of people say, well, you know, we went to the moon, we've done all these analyses. What else can we really learn from from the moon? But I think this is a fantastic example of mm -hmm. showing that actually there's so much more we can still use and get out of that's new from these 50 year old samples, which is just amazing, really. I, th I think that ties back into the earlier discussion about EBSD and atom probe being very new for us planetary scientists. Like these techniques have been around for 50 years, so nearly as long as the Apollo samples, but we're now starting to routinely use them for this kind of work. So yeah, revisiting the Apollo samples at this kind of nanoscale sort of analyses, pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> so how much longer have you got your post in? Uh, officially until December. Right, okay, okay. I'm currently going through the game of applying for fellowships and... Yeah, the old rigmarole. <laughs> yeah. Do you think you'd like to stay in Canada? It's, um, Toronto's such a wonderful city. Yeah, oh no, I mean, we, we've loved our time here, but yeah, I think probably back to the UK now. Yeah. Okay. Kind of the plan, yeah. So um, my, my wife and I are actually expecting in two months' time. Oh, wow. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. So, yeah, thank you. So yeah, for family reasons, I think, getting back to the UK. And, yeah, well, that makes um, sense. Yeah, yeah we'll see, see where we end up. Uh, yeah, so the final question that we ask all of our guests, which you probably know if you've listened to the podcast before, is um, if you could be doing something else completely different, either in academia or outside of it, what would you want to do? Um, so <laughs> my original dream, strangely, was to be an oceanographer. Oh, okay. So I, I don't know why, I guess like, you know, deep By ocean. the sea and... being in Portsmouth, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah look, look at it long enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, that, that was kind of my original, my original dream. Yeah. So, 
that, that got me into, conversely, that got me into geoscience in the first place. So trying to understand mm-hmm. the rocks in the deep ocean. That was kind of mm-hmm. my, my teenage logic going into it. Mm-hmm. And ended up getting sort of swayed by the planetary sciences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, regardless of how dedicated you are, someone sticks a meteorite in front of you, you kind of wonder. <laughs> well, that's yeah, very yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, Lee, thank you very much uh, for joining yeah. us this week. No, thank, thank you. Thank you. And we'll put links to some of the papers we've mentioned uh, in this episode in the episode description if uh, all you lovely lot in the audience would like to have a read. Uh, but yes, in the meantime, uh, Lee, thank you once again, and I uh, hope uh, the rest of lockdown goes well for you in Canada. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I hope, uh, hope you're able to get out fairly soon. Yeah. Anyway, cool. Lee, thank you very much. Uh, and for all of you in the audience, we'll see you all again very soon, next week, in fact. Um, and if you want some more Earth and planetary science content, do check us out on the social medias everywhere on the twitters and the facebooks and the instagrams we're at earth solar system links will be in the episode description but until then see you all very soon goodbye